Hey guys, uh, good morning. Let's get going with the next session. So uh, before we kind of begin, just wanted to understand from you, uh, based on booklet one, did you guys try it? Because I couldn't see any questions over there. Have you guys tried? Have you guys had a look at it? Were there any questions? Just a second. Yeah. Did you guys have a look at it? Did you guys have any questions? Anything on that? Which agar samajh mein in the first few chapters. <clears throat> looks like no questions maybe see uh i'll just let you guys know that you know up until now even if you guys haven't had time or uh motivation whatever it is to uh practice questions thoroughly you will end up realizing that uh you know you guys will uh unnecessarily be behind the schedule just because of not practicing questions because a lot of things I'll be covering in the class, of course, we'll cover as much as we possibly can, but you'll add this, you know, simultaneously, you'll have to solve a lot of questions. Abhita, even if it was not done, that is fine. Uh, from now onwards, just ensure that, you know, we have we keep a habit of ensuring key the moment chapters and the moment a particular section gets completed, uh, we'll try to ensure that we look at, you know, that particular segment and uh, uh, move on. Even specifically, the first few chapters, like I mentioned, chapter zero to four, the first five chapters for that matter. Uh, they may seemingly look like very easy for that matter, but the questions later on you will realize that come from over there can be very painful. And uh, we've had a lot of discussions on this. Ki se questions uh, aate hai. It's not like, uh, you know, questions don't come from over there. And uh, the matter of fact is that from initial chapters, if there is a question that comes, it can end up being slightly more tricky in that sense as well. And there can be a lot of, you know, background information, a lot of things over there, which will be foundational for you to be able to crack questions that may come later on. Even for that matter, these three chapters, which we'll be doing chapter number five, which is benefits and then six and seven, which is life and GI products. The, this is basically, you know, let's just say capture the ekdam absolute foundation of the work that we're supposed to do. By the time we're done with all of these foundational chapters, you should ideally be in a position wherein you understand products, wherein you can comprehend any questions. And the moment you have a question, you are at least aware of the background and its situation. Even if there is something that does not uh, appear let's just say understood at that point of time we'll pick those things up one by one uh moving forwards but understanding of questions or understanding of background is where we should ideally be at by the end of the next three chapters which will be uh tomorrow or maybe you know next week so by then getting this foundational things absolutely clear will be uh super important having said that you will look at this question as well and uh in aiq forum if you just log in you will have a link wherein you can look at a lot, lot of uh, uh, you know chapter five ka basically pre work post work questions uh, have been posted over there. I hope you guys had time to just have a look at that. Uh, if no, just ensure that you do it properly after the end of today's class because now you will end up realizing that in a lot of classes and in a lot of sections that we'll be covering, a lot of things that gets asked in the question paper or in the questions are much more different as compared to what uh you know we cover up over here and we can only holistically only cover so much uh this is more so true for chapter number five just questions that we have given over there those are relatively older questions so just to give you a little more background let's just say we complete chapter five six seven most likely uh, when you are doing the revision notes for that you will end up finding it's not very difficult you might find it it gets reasonably difficult you are able to crack it but the moment you look at those kind of questions, the uh, questions that you would, that used to get asked earlier, and which are the kind of, let's just say, which is the pattern which both the institutes, I and IFO are kind of looking to ask you guys these days, those questions are slightly more different and complicated as compared to, if not complicated, different at least, as compared to, you know, what we'll be covering over here or what has been covered in the uh, last few papers. So that again is something which will become uh, very important for us to crack. Just one second, there was this one question. There are some of the questions, was able to generate a few points, but not enough to get good marks. However, from solutions, I was able to understand what points they were trying to make from a few particular questions. And that is going to be the biggest learning problem. That's actually the learning that you will have from this. Initially, it is fine even if you're not able to get, uh, you know, all the points correct. But once you're able to understand ki achha, exactly these are the thought processes that you need to generate, or, you know, what is the line of thought process that you need to think through, it will become much more clearer for you going forwards.
So before we kind of begin, why don't we do, do just one very quick thing before I kind of move on to the next chapter. Uh, given the first segment is uh, covered up, I'll take maybe a you know very quick five ten minutes revision of the entire content so that it becomes very uh, uh, let's just say structured uh, for us as we're kind of moving forward. Uh, looked at the first chapter, chapter zero, uh, ACC. If you remember, within this, the biggest takeaway is specifying, developing, and monitoring the experience. You need to be very careful about what needs to be kept in specifying the problem because there isn't a structure to it. The structure is only towards developing the solution and monitoring the experience. So monitoring the experience is completion of loop and developing the solution basically will have all the points that comes on model assumptions, data, alternative solutions, and all those things, which we'll look at in chapter 17, 18, 19 as well. So developing the solution, we are only considered largely about how you will build the model, what kind of data you will use, where will you get that data from, uh, uh, you know, what are the assumptions that you will be using? Will you use historical assumptions? How will you look forward looking assumptions? Those kind of thing is going to come within development of solution. So other than that, everything is going to come within ident uh, specifying the problem. So that is probably the biggest takeaway from this chapter. Uh, of course, there are others as well, but you will notice that in this term only, both IA and IFOA had questions coming in directly from ECC. Uh, IA had even a 15 mark uh, question on part one, the last question. Uh, so that basically goes on to say that while it may look very easy, there are questions that come from over here and it is easy in that sense. It's not very difficult. The next few chapters can still be complicated. It cannot be that complicated. So ultimately you need to understand what are the kind of basically you need to be able to bifurcate the points and put it into the correct set of brackets. Then comes your professionalism, which we'll discuss in the next chapter, general economic and commercial environment in a way, which we'll discuss in the uh, next chapter. Actual advice within this identifying the stakeholders, of course, is very important. What can be the different conflict of interest between all the different stakeholders? That is another very important point. A lot of practical questions can come from over here. We looked at April 2023 ka question paper. The first three questions was specifically from this chapter alone. Identify the stakeholders. What are the different conflict of interest? And what is the work that you will do as an actually before you start your engagement on that particular work? So you need to be very aware. You need to be aware of those stakeholders. Within stakeholders, we have had a look at what are the general ones which you can put everywhere and what are the specific ones which you need to think through. Uh, not a lot of uh, things that will be very helpful for you over here. TAS and all, they, didn't really, they don't really expect you to you know, know everything from TAS or any or, or you know uh, specific cases over here. Haven't really seen a question come from uh, this place and uh, they haven't really explained it explicitly as well. Uh, next is external environment. And this is kind of Pandora's box because this opens a box wherein they can basically one way or the other cover up anything because external environment includes basically everything. Create grand list is basically something that you need to remember. IAI folks definitely remember the entire mnemonic. It will be very easy for you if at all a direct question comes from external environment, which is a possibility in IAI. IFOA folks, uh, folks, it becomes very important for you to understand everything uh, that comes from within this. Uh, we have had a look at what are the different aspects of uh, external environment. Uh, emission trading pay, we looked at one question, but we will go deeper, so you don't have to worry about it. Climate change, for the timing, we are not looking at it, although we have had a look at a couple of questions, but specific targeting of climate change is kind of not yet done. Capital adequacy and solvency will actually be covered later on. So these three are very important aspects. Jin say, uh, it is highly likely that a you know, full 50 mark question can potentially come. And we will gradually keep picking up questions from over here so that we are strengthened. Other than this, a lot of, uh, of uh, you know points that you may find over here, we have basically tried to cover a significant chunk of it one way or the other. Next comes your regulation. Within regulation, we have looked at you know principal aims, GRIP. This is very important. Direct questions, even from IFO till date, comes from over here. So be very careful about it. Direct cost is basically cost that goes out of your pocket. Indirect cost is not out of pocket. It, it's not money monetary in that sense. But you know we have had a look at or two different varieties uh, in which it can come, basically three different varieties. One is from producers, one is from consumers, and second one from intermediary. How overconfidence and everything plays a role in these indirect costs. Need for regulations, we had a look at that. Anti-selection moral hazard, be very careful about it. This is something that you can end up using at any particular place. This is like a filler uh, a point that can come at any particular point you'll end up realizing later on. So. Very quickly going through regulation and ensure that you know you guys are going through this because these cover more or less everything uh, of the chapter, right? So be very careful. I think you should have a hard copy of this set. If no, ensure that you're getting it uh, delivered to yourself and uh, uh, ensure that you know at the end of every chapter you're able to cover up the entire chapter with this uh, you know one page or alone. 
and final uh, introduction to financial products and customer needs which will be carrying forward in this particular chapter as well now this again is kind of similar to external environment a lot of products that we had over here we have had a look at mortgage backed security i hope this and asset backed security should be absolutely clear a couple of in depth questions were also looked at although we don't really have all the information that is needed uh, right now handy but still i think these products should be absolutely clear to you other than that there are few more products what is spv what is securitization all of those things should be absolutely clear and to sum it up with or to just end the note before i begin the next chapter one thing one let's just say very big takeaway that you guys should be aware of now is that there is a particular pattern if you realize just say uh, someone had said today also uh, pratham like you mentioned ki when you looked at questions you end up identifying that there is a certain pattern to a particular question that they uh, uh, crack right you will end up realizing much later on but there is one code which can be applicable in 90% of the cases whenever there is a question and we have discussed it earlier as well but you know it, it doesn't come naturally to us until and unless we force it in the first few classes and later on it becomes a, a natural thing to you so in the questions you will end up in in, in a lot of questions rather you will be placed with a particular situation and you are required to generate points out of it that's that's the broad overview of questions pattern in cp1 you need to be careful about picking a particular point ki apne one particular point is what you picked up for instance let's say securitization right ab uh, securitization ke bare mein you have to write and what are the let's say benefits or drawbacks or let's say you are supposed to mention securitization a broad ended or open ended question like that can come it has come historically mistakes that people do is they pick up one or two points and then you know they do active voice passive voice increase the breadth of the points but it's not really comprehensive or it's not really enough to cover the entire uh, chunk of what is required to be covered so the best way to go about it is pick up one particular point exhaust it have counter thesis to that point and then move on so for instance if i let's just say if we are if you're given a question on mortgage backed security picking it up because we did it very recently you pick up mortgage backed security as a point and let's just say you're evaluating that investment right ki aap invest you are evaluating whether or not to invest in mortgage backed security number 8 in that situation you can pick up that particular mortgage backed security now think through the lens of an investor what are the things what are the what are the advantages that you get the biggest advantage is that you can get let's just say relatively higher rate of interest so the moment you pick up higher rate of interest write a lot about it then pick up a counter thesis point say that however it may not uh, always be the case because it can be a recourse arrangement as well or however there can be an increased risk of default in case of a uh, uh, mortgage backed security then you pick up another situation wherein you talk about recourse arrangement so aapko ye information diya hua nahi rahega whether it is a recourse arrangement or whether it is not you need to pick up assumptions exhaust it and then move on ki acha if it is recourse this is what will happen however it may be non recourse as well in which this case will happen but when it is non recourse i will anticipate a higher rate of return but if it is recourse i anticipate a lower rate of return so all of these things is not going to come from the question it stems from your own understanding so answer jab aap dekhoge right now and a lot of answers that you will look later on as well you will end up finding acha ye point doesn't seem natural in this particular question and those points if you look at it the idea or the stem behind it is you pick up a point exhaust it have some counter thesis like however the you pick up a uh, again reiterating you pick up one of the points let's say recourse you exhaust it you say however in case of recourse i will have a higher risk of default and then you pick up another thing but in situ in a situation where in the mortgage backed security is non recourse in that situation i will probably get a much more uh, uh, let's say higher rate of return but there will be higher rate of a uh, higher possibility of default as well so if it is something that meets within my bracket of risk th threshold you know i can go ahead and buy that particular security if no i should uh, bought that particular uh, uh, security for that matter so that is the kind of thought process i would say which comes within these answers and that thought process is what you will only get after you have solved plenty of questions so start solving if not even if not now this is probably the last time i'll i'll be repeating it you're still not late it's just the start of june you can still pick up uh, you know booklet number 1 go ahead look at a lot of questions and have that mental stem as to what are the points that are missing and what is the direction you will once you have cracked ki this is what institute is asking out of me you will realize that everything else can be taken care of because classes will be covered every chapter will be covered a few questions from every chapter will be covered 
and uh, uh, you know uh, recent papers everything will cover more or less everything but still that doesn't guarantee success because you still aren't answering question as per the requirement of theirs so for that you will have to realize by yourself that you know that stem needs to come from within uh, uh, you only and that can only come if you have solved a lot of questions on a day in day out basis if i write a point which is not in the examiner report but i give proper justification will the exam uh, will the examiner uh, give the marks uh, aditi remind me this right after the class as well and we'll discuss uh, this particular point but after the class has ended and this is a question that comes every now and then i really didn't have you know a concrete answer to it up until some time back but now i do so i'll i'll, I'll uh, try and disseminate the information to the best of my abilities we'll pick that up towards the end <clears throat> but yeah i think other things are absolute should ideally absolutely be clear and uh, let's move on to the new chapter which is benefit overview and provider of benefits now over here is where probably problems will start popping up yahan se thoda problem you know it, 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 the things might end up becoming slightly more problematic as compared to what it was up until now because this chapter and going forwards you will have to be prepared for every word to be looked at you know in multiple ways right the word benefit sometimes is used in in its literal sense and sometimes is used in a sense wherein what we usually call benefit so i tell you i hear the word benefits in not in general but in actual terms right the moment i hear the word benefits in actual terms i am thinking of pension directly ki benefit matlab pension and that can potentially cover something else like old age benefit or something incremental that comes as a part of me providing service to my employer or because of something that is provided to me by the government ye do hi cheez usually comes to your mind whenever you are thinking of the word benefits in actual terms so in this chapter they take the word benefits in their lit in its literal sense to begin with but as we kind of progress later on and you will realize in chapter 30 32 as well they will use the word benefit in actual sense as well wherein you are supposed to understand the word benefits as it is ki uh, uh, in actual sense like pension so one benefit basically is equal to pension another benefit is basically in its literal sense wherein we are talking about the literal english meaning of the word benefit kahan pe kya utilize hoga you don't really have to worry about that too much if you look at the pdf which has been uploaded for chapter number 5 most of the questions over there benefits is kind of used in its literal sense ki benefits kya hoga and and, and you know uh, let's just call it english so benefits is used in this particular chapter as english but later on you will realize ki benefits will be used as a proxy towards the word uh, pension so you'll have to be prepared for that and that can only come while reading once you've read and comprehended the question it won't really be that difficult but you need to be prepared for it is what i'm trying to say so within the uh, within this chapter we'll look at benefit more holistically in the sense we'll look at the english uh, understanding of this particular word and it is not just confined to state benefits or employer benefits there are other sources which can come for uh, benefits as well so first let's start with the sources of benefits uh, before we move on to how these benefits come yes so there are five most important or five most common providers of benefit the one is the state of course and you should be prepared because of what we did in chapter 1 2 the word state is used interchangeably with government So the first is your state, which is nothing but the government. Second is employer, or it can be a group of employer. Doesn't really matter. Now these two are the common sources of benefits. The next three are what come because of the stem, or or you know because of the way in which we are comprehending the term benefit right now. It can be individual, which means you, me. I think we had discussed this in in the last or the you know uh, in the last couple of chapters that benefit can come from you as well when you are making certain savings. it is a benefit that is provided to you by yourself the next one can be financial institutions which is basically let's say a mutual fund industry or a bank whenever your savings accrue in a particular fund it can you know keep accumulating and by the end of that particular term you will end up getting certain benefits or certain accruals a life insurance company providing certain savings instrument can also come within uh, part number 4 and the final one is other organizations isn't really explicitly explained but there are certain ngo certain other organizations which can do one thing or the other which you can't really bifurcate in number 1 2 3 4 because they are not government they are not your employers that is not you yourself and that is not a financial institution but still you can accrue some form of benefits out of it so these are the five major providers of benefits 
within that you need to be careful about what are the different roles played by different uh, institutes for that matter whenever they are providing benefits what are the different roles played by the state whenever they are providing benefit uh, what is the employer's role whenever they are providing benefit these are two important stems for us to understand we'll look at that one more question that comes from over here which isn't explicitly explained as a part of the syllabus uh, in this chapter but it comes is okay you are an employer they'll give you some more information some more background and you know you have hired 10 different folks and say suppose you are doing let's just say you're providing them with a fixed salary plus 10 percent pension something of that sort now they will ask you questions on how can you control that particular expense they might give you some incremental stem that you know the expenses have run over what your estimates were how can you take care of that how can you budget for that how can you plan for that those kind of questions have also historically come very recent papers you won't find a lot of question that comes on you know control of all of these but this is a part of chapter number five and hence it's a part of syllabus as well so we'll look at that just in order to ensure that you know we can get a broader understanding of this as well which is mostly covered in the pdf which is uploaded on aiq forum right now so we'll look at what are the different roles but these five are the different providers that should be absolutely clear what are the different sort of risks which are associated with pension and you know different benefits we'll look at that as well so let's just move back a little and let's just look at benefits in the sense we usually call benefits which is basically pension so the word benefits like i mentioned we you we will end up using it as a proxy towards pension in multiple cases so the key features and now we are looking at the word benefits in terms of pension so the key features of pension contract are as you know it's stemmed out over there they're primarily used as a means of providing income in your retirement so once you've retired you get a certain source of income and that is by way of pension right uh, it may provide other benefits as well for example a lump sum payment to dependents it may have options to change the form or timing of the payments as well which means add the uh, an option at the retirement to exchange a proportion of the uh, pension payment for cash payment now there is a specific word for it what do you call when a stream of payments of pension is converted into a lump sum at a particular point of time you should ideally know this but you know that word is basically come going to come multiple times later on as well so at retirement if you are converting say suppose you receive 20000 per month post retirement instead of that you are converting the 5000 into let's just say a lump sum of 10 lakhs and you will continue to receive 15000 per month now that converted 5000 what do you call it or the process of conversion yes commutation so the word pension does not necessarily always have to mean of you know monthly amount or an annual amount it's not that annuity amount only even if you're commuting which means even if you're converting a stream of payments into a fixed lump sum at a particular point of time that is also pension if on your death you end up uh, your spouse ends up getting let's just say 50 percent uh, post your death that is also a part of your pension if on the death of both both the parents the ch the children ends up getting some lump sum that is also a part of your pension only so pension word usually the stem i get out of it is that you know the stream of payment that i will receive post my retirement that is incorrect it also means the commuted amount it also means what my spouse will get it also means what my children may end up getting as a part of that particular contract so you need to be very careful about all of these things featuring within pension itself it can also sometimes include uh, long term care as well there is also restoration uh, of pension yes aditya will 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 cover everything don't worry so these are long term arrangements here so ha uh, next a provider of pensions so pension can be provided by two different sectors uh, it can be you know it can be provided by the state or it can be provided by the private sector uh now within that we need to be careful about three different uh types of pensions um, uh, pension members one is active one is deferred members and the other one is current pensioners the word active the, the i mean the moment you read it you may feel like it is the people who are receiving pension right now but that is incorrect so be, be very careful and ensure that you have understood the difference between these three an active is a member which is basically accruing future benefits which is all of us in the class right now we're working right now in order to and we are contributing towards our pension so that once we retire we end up getting that particular pension so that is basically active so active is nothing but the current working population which is accruing pension as we kind of move ahead so that is active second one is deferred members now this is basically something which is kind of complicated 
डेफोल्ड मेंबर्स का मतलब मिस्टर एक्स वाई जेड ही वर्क फॉर टेन ईयर्स इन एच डी एफ सी लाइफ वेर इन ही अक्रूड अ पर्टिकुलर पेंशन he left the work after 10 years at hdfc life and he started working at let's say icic prudential now he is accruing another pension and assume that you know there is no transfer or something like that kuch transfer nahi hua so in that case mr x who worked at hdfc life becomes a deferred member of pension at hdfc life that is the meaning of deferred member which is basically someone who had accrued some benefit earlier He is not yet receiving that particular benefit. Mr. X is not receiving pensions yet. He has not attained the age of sixty or sixty-five for retirement. But he had accrued something in the past. It might still be accruing at a particular rate of interest going forward. But he will only realize the benefit after his retirement from that particular place. So he is a deferred member for HDFC life, and he is an active member for uh, ICICI Prudential. Now this thing should be absolutely clear that one particular person. can be both a deferred member and an active member in two different institutes so deferred member if you look at it it says members who have stopped earning any future benefits but who have an existing benefit entitlement that will come into payment in the future so this an example is an employee who used to work for a sponsoring company but has now left to work for another company so mr x who used to work for hdfc life earlier who accrued some pension benefits over there has now left hdfc life but there is a certain chunk of accrual that he still holds on to which is not commuted which is not received yet which he will receive after retirement at the age of 55 60 65 as the case may be so he is a deferred member for that scheme and he is an active member for icic prudential scheme now this should be absolutely clear and the third one and the easiest is current pensioner who are the people who have retired and are currently receiving those benefit entitlements be very clear just see they have said benefit entitlements it doesn't say money or it doesn't say cash or it doesn't say uh, you know annuity or monthly amount something like that any form of benefit that you are entitled to after you retire falls as a part of your current pension uh, uh, as a part of your current pension <clears throat> now this is i think uh, one of the most critical aspects and even after a lot of deliberation we end up uh finding people who are not really able to identify the differences between defined benefit scheme and defined contribution scheme because there isn't a fixed formula to it before i move forward just one thing ill health retirement people are deferred member you know if, if you let's just say if you are in ill health and you have retired from that particular place you are accruing those benefits right so you are not a deferred member you end up becoming an active pensioner in that case so the idea okay the difference between a deferred member and a current pensioner is a deferred member is likely still in workforce or is likely still active in the sense he is working so for example i work at hdfc life for 10 years see suppose i stop working over there and now i am starting my own venture something of that sort i must have accrued some bit of pension which i will receive only after the age of 65 so i continue to remain a deferred member of that particular scheme irrespective of whether i am working somewhere or not because i am only going to get that benefit after the age of 65 if let's just say this particular scheme provides that if mr x uh, becomes ill in that case he can uh, you know or let's just say there is critical illness as a result of critical illness mr x can get benefits which he had accrued at hdfc life and say suppose he becomes critically ill at the age of 45 in that case now he is a current pensioner so the difference between deferred and current is a current pensioner is entitled to receive benefits based on the documentation of that scheme if the scheme provides that you become critically ill you end up getting the amount in that case you are a current pensioner but if the scheme only provides that you will get after the age of 60 or 65 or a particular risk event that needs to happen you will continue to remain a deferred member until you have started receiving your benefits so in your example um, aditi ill health retirement the person has retired assuming i am assuming that the scheme provides for ill health retirement care agar provide karta hai and if you are accruing and if you have already started getting benefits in that case you are a current pensioner one very simple and easy litmus test is ask yourself a question uh, am i getting any benefit right now if the answer is yes then you are a current pensioner if the answer to that is no you are still deferred i mean you will only get benefits after 5 years 10 years or after a particular risk event in that case you are a deferred member so in health retirement mein ho and you are getting certain benefits you are getting reimbursement of medical expenses or you know whatever way you are getting that particular amount in case you are getting any benefit you are a current pensioner 
So having said that, moving on to the next one, which is defined benefit scheme and defined contribution scheme. In a lot of cases, people end up making a lot of mistakes within this. So the simple formula that you guys need to always use is, is my retirement benefit dependent upon my contribution? Do I know? And, and you know, in a lot of cases, wait, let me first pick up the mistakes. In a lot of cases, people say that if I know what I will get after the retirement, in that case, it is a benefit scheme. If I don't know what I will get after the retirement, in that case, it's a contribution scheme. perception So I'll, I'll repeat what a lot of people end up making mistake on. They say that if I know what I will get after retirement, okay, I'm, I'm entitled to a particular amount. In that case, it's a defined benefit scheme. If I do not know what I'll get after my retirement, in that case, it's a defined contribution scheme. Now, this stem can end up making a lot of errors for you as you're kind of moving ahead. So let me just pick up a particular example. Let me just jot it out on the chat on the chat box and you guys let me know what do you think about it. Whether it's a defined benefit scheme and defined contribution scheme, be very, uh, uh, you know, be very okay with making mistakes right now. It doesn't really matter. So you are an employee at now let's just say all right so I've given the first one. It says that you are an employee at Reliance. After your retirement, you will get number A, 2x of your monthly salary uh, at retirement multiplied by the number of years of service. Is it a defined benefit scheme or is it a defined contribution scheme? But it's surprisingly no mistakes. This is the first time I think nobody has uh, said DC. I think the stem was made a little easier as well. But in this case, can you tell me what is the amount that I will get? I mean, a lot of people say that DB scheme, ka, when I ask definition, they say that DB scheme, mein I know what I'll get. DC scheme, mein I don't know what I'll get. It depends upon accrual. But in this case, the example that I gave, and you guys have correctly said that it's a DB scheme, I still don't know what it is that I will get, right? I don't know what my, what my salary will be when I'm 60 or 65. So if I don't know what I will get, how can I call it defined benefit? My, de my benefits in that case is not known, right? It's not certain. My benefits are still uncertain is what my understanding is right now. So why is it defined benefit? Correct. So the amount over here is not fixed, but the rule for calculation of benefits is fixed. So now whenever the methodology, and this is a better way to understand if you just you know look at that particular uh, uh, sentence that Hitesh has given and you apply it to all the situations 99 percent of the cases you will end up getting you know proper differentiation between whether it's a defined benefit scheme or whether it's a uh, defined contribution scheme and there are one or two percentage points which is here and there but we'll look at that uh, in a few questions so or clear earlier it used to be a very important segment and they would you know provide certain background which is not very easy to comprehend uh, you will get lost in understanding whether it's a DB scheme and a DC scheme and you end up making mistakes and they end up asking you questions of anywhere between 15, 20, 25 months. As a hota tha historically. Uh, but we'll be care and recently off late last few terms, it hasn't really happened. So we'll be careful about it anyways. So if the amount, whether so I'm, I'm not really concerned about whether I'm getting 50,000, whether I'm getting 70,000, I'm not really concerned about that exact number. I may still be uncertain with that particular exact number which I'm getting. But if the amount which I get is dependent or let's just say if it's a fixed formula for calculation of benefit is given, in that case, it, be it becomes a defined benefit because the way benefits will be received is kind of defined that, you know, it will be multiplied. It, it will basically be number of years of service multiplied by monthly uh, uh, amount that you're receiving. It can be last three years is average salary that you have received multiplied by the number of years of service something of that sort you don't really know it can also be inflation linked it can also be index linked it can also be unit linked all of those things come later on but if the receipt or if let's just say the benefit that i'm supposed to receive 
is calculated in such a way the calculation for which is defined by a particular formula in that case it becomes a defined benefit scheme however if there is if, if there isn't any such formula which exists out there and if i am you know just going to be contributing to a particular fund and after the end of the tenor whatever is accrued in that particular fund is going to be received by me in that case it becomes a defined contribution scheme the easiest way to understand defined contribution scheme is it will look very much similar or very much aligned to a mutual fund ki mutual fund mein kya hota hai every month i i'm i'm assuming a lot of you might be uh, doing sips you end up putting 10k 5k 12k 20k 50000 whatever it is you keep accruing that particular amount every month without any knowledge of what you will end up getting in return of course you have the anticipation ki historically 12% hai to i may end up getting 12% or i'll get at least 8% or i may get 14% something of that sort you have a target rate at the back of your mind but it is not guaranteed right so in case of a defined contribution the amount you are contributing or the formula for calculation of the amount that you are contributing is fixed so in that case it can be 12% of your salary gets contributed every year or 15% of your salary gets contributed every month something of that sort is known so the formula for contributions is defined in this case but what you will get in the return at the end of tenure is not known in a dc scheme in a db scheme however the formula for what you will get at the end of the tenure is known but what you will contribute to get that to get to that particular amount is kind of unknown in a db scheme now it is not dependent on returns on contribution paid for the scheme all right so defined benefit scheme mein ye hota hai and defined contribution scheme mein ye hota hai in defined contribution the methodology or the formula for contributions are fixed in a defined benefits the methodology or the amount or the formula for calculation of your particular benefits which, which you will receive after your retirement is kind of known so this is uh, the kind of difference uh, 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 major let's just say line of difference between the two um right so within defined benefit scheme just going a little deeper because you know questions may end up coming in such a way wherein it it creates a lot of in it, it creates a lot of uh, confusion uh, confusion defined benefit scheme may if your benefits are defined but your contributions are not who is actually paying for that particular amount who ends up paying for the particular defined benefit scheme employer that is correct just give me one second guys we'll just take it just give me one second uh yeah guys sorry so employer contributes sponsors of the scheme sponsors of the scheme okay so uh we will we'll pick up the exact uh, terminology as we kind of move ahead but a few things that you need to be clear about within defined benefit scheme is that a defined benefit scheme does not necessarily have to mean that there are no contributions right because questions will be crafted or might be crafted in such a way which will end up creating this confusion at the back of your mind ki they are talking about contributions in in this situation so you end up thinking that it's a defined contribution scheme while it may not necessarily be a defined contribution scheme right so the litmus test like we discussed so far is that a defined benefit scheme will have a certain methodology or a formula for calculation of benefits which is stated up front it can be based on multiplier of salary or it can be based on whatever it is 
but you know how your benefits will be calculated in a defined contribution scheme the only thing that is known is how your contributions will be calculated and in both the cases it can be a formula it did need not necessarily be a exact amount that's 50000 20000 something like that next biggest problem which we just discussed was ki how do you end up realizing that defined benefit scheme is funded and it creates another uh, you know line of discussion there are certain db schemes which are funded certain db schemes which are unfunded and we'll look at a, you know a, a lot of things as we kind of move ahead there are different ways in which you can fund a particular scheme as well uh, which will pick up as a part of our next chapter um, but there are multiple thought processes within or you know at the at, you know behind this as well and you need to be slightly careful about uh, these things you it need not necessarily be that just because it's a defined benefit scheme it means that there is no funding going at the back uh, 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 behind it so that is something you need to be careful about there can be some funding which are going behind it as well now those things will become slightly more clear when we look at different parameters of risks over here right and what is hybrid scheme we'll look at that in a bit so what is investment risk and who bears the or investment risk yeah let me just put it out when you are investing let's, let's just say when you are putting your money in mutual funds right you are bearing with some certain investment risk right investment risk in that particular case can be you know you don't end up getting the returns that you desired the returns end up being lower than your competitors or your returns end up being insufficient to meet your overall requirements or it doesn't beat the inflation there can be multiple cases that can happen with your returns right so investment risk is basically that you contributed but at the end of the particular tenure when you are setting back and doing the mental calculation or you know doing all the calculation you end up realizing that the return is insufficient now investment risk in case of defined benefit scheme who bears that investment risk and in case of defined contribution scheme who bears the investment risk and let's just keep it simple at least for now you only need to def uh, uh you only need to differentiate between employer and employee tb employer dc employee so far a couple of people have said this employer in defined benefit employee in defined contribution all right all right so answers are absolutely correct now how can me as an employee bear the investment risk when i'm not even investing this should be the next question over here might seem very silly to a few and might seem very confusing to a few so me as an employer and let's just put it this way let's just take a practical stance right now most of us over here in the class if you assuming that a lot of us are working i would like to believe that most of us are a part of defined contribution scheme all of us are probably contributing to epfo in india and we'll get a and we'll get at, at retirement jo bhi accrue hoga we'll get that particular amount we don't know what it is going to be yet but we know how how much our contribution is my contribution is 12% of my basic salary for a lot of you guys as well it might be 12% of your basic salary so say suppose i am in my amount is let's just say 12000 a month that goes into contribution right if i am not even let's just say doing that particular investment the investment is being done by someone else how am i subject to investment risk shouldn't the investment risk be for the person who is investing ah uh, aditi 99% correct hai what can be a 100% correct answer over here i think the second line over here kind of addresses most of the point i'm not sure if a lot of you guys didn't even understand this so investment risk ma'am the first example that i gave in investment risk was i'm contributing a particular amount to mutual fund and at the end of the year i realized i got only 10% while inflation was 11% and every contributor got 20% right so because of my poor investment i ended up getting lower return which is what i defined as investment risk if i do not invest properly or because of external factors i end up not getting returns which are desired which is let's just say the biggest source of investment risk for me now in a defined contribution scheme you guys me all of us we are not even aware of where our money is going still how everyone over here how did you say that in 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 a defined contribution scheme the employee will end up getting the investment risk mai to invest kar bhi nahi raha when i'm not even investing how am i subject to investment risk
the returns are not fixed on the amount default risk default risk thoda sa extreme ho gaya in this case i'm still not getting the perfect answer i'll i'll wait for maybe one more minute might get less compared to if we invested ourselves not exactly the comparison is not that so if i invest i get something versus i go through the contribution scheme i get something that is not the that is not the comparison going on over here and i'll repeat the question for one last time if my contributions and all of you guys combined our contribution is going into epfo we are not even aware of the investment we are not even having any say on what investment can be done over here how can you guys end up getting the burnt of investment risk jab aap invest kar hi nahi rahe ho the investment risk should ideally be the fund right it should be epfo who is bearing the burnt of this all right i i'm not sure if there is any confusion agar koi confusion ho to still let me know so in case of any particular risk whenever you are looking at a risk one big confusion right now and this thing will come later on as well because risk is a segment jisme seven eight chapters covered hain and there you will end up getting a lot of pain so i want to you know let's just say share some bit of pain there jo aapko wahan hoga uh, carrying it on over here and uh, it might be slightly painful for you right now but later on it will ease our process whenever you are looking at any particular risk do ensure so in this case if i were to talk about the risk no yes i mean me as an individual i'm not bearing any risk because i'm not making any investment so ultimately risk is not a factor of who is ultimately or you know who is carrying that risk it is a factor of who is ultimately bearing that risk so that is something that you need to be uh, you know careful about in case of this investment kon kar raha epfo kar raha hai right of course yes i am aware of the fact that epfo is the one who is doing investments in this particular case the reason why the burden of their poor investment comes on me is because i am not going to be compensated for their uh, you know lackluster performance the same goes for i mean if you think of it my same question i can apply to a mutual fund as well ki when you are investing in a mutual fund the fund manager puts the money elsewhere right so how are you subjected to investment risk the reason why you are subjected to investment risk is because ultimately whether he performs good or whether he performs bad the result is going to directly fall upon your heads so whenever you are looking at any risk ideally you should be looking at who bears the final you know grinding of that particular risk so in this case whenever an investment is happening in case of a defined contribution scheme why do i say it is on me because i mean epfo may perform poorly they may perform good it doesn't matter i will only get a particular amount and i can and i mean i cannot go back to them and say see you gave me such poor performance you compensate me something extra that is not going to happen right same goes for mutual funds as well you put 10000 in a mutual fund at the end of the year suppose it's 10000 only nifty 10 ka 20000 ho gaya but your amount stays at 10 ka 10 only what can you do about it you cannot do anything about it so ultimately investment risk and any risk for that matter should be looked at from the eyes of the person who bears the final amount in case of db scheme why do I, and in case of db scheme why did you why did all of you say employer because my final amount let's just say let's let's just take i mean let's just look back at the example say suppose my salary is 1 lakh at retirement and they give me 1 lakh ka pension every month right my salary was 1 lakh at retirement i am subjected to getting 1 lakh ka pension at each and every month now whether the investment overperforms which means if the investment is done in such a way that you know it it, it is enough to give me 1.2 lakh doesn't really matter why because i'll only get 1 lakh same goes for uh, poor performance of investment as well say suppose reliance jiska main employee hu reliance does very bad investment as a result of which the amount that it has accrued is only 80k a month doesn't really matter why because my amount of 1 lakh rupees will be received irrespective default is a separate thing default risk is a separate risk i'm not talking about that but irrespective of you know i mean the ultimate benefit of investment is accrued to reliance the ultimate loss of investments is also borne by reliance as a result of that we end up saying that investment risk in this particular case is borne by the uh, employer and not by us so that thought process needs to come risk ko jab bhi evaluate karo whenever you are evaluating any particular risk don't look at who is dealing with that risk that is immaterial you should look at who is bearing the final 
you know poor performance or under performance ka risk and who is getting the benefit of exceptional performance in that case in case of investment returns if it is very good in defined contribution scheme it is good for me i'll get a lot of benefit out of it if the performance is absolutely poor if it is 0% return i will have to bear that risk who who who, who undertook that particular i mean i mean who undertook poor performance it was epfo but who bears the burden of that risk it's me so always look for who bears the burden of that risk that stem needs to come in every particular uh, question going forwards so i think with that investment risk theek hai now let's move on to the other risk and i hope it will be relatively more clear or increasing longevity after retirement at the point of retirement if your longevity is very high who will bear the i mean where where does the where does the risk lie in case of defined contribution scheme who bears the risk in case of defined benefit scheme who bears the risk and this is an easy one वेरी क्विकली एक एक करके सारे का दे दो ना हुस विच रिस्क इन विच केस इंक्रीज लॉन्जिविटी इन केस ऑफ ये इन बोथ डीबी में एम्प्लॉई एंड डीसी में एम्प्लॉयर It just one second. Ha, in case of defined benefit, it is employer, and in case of defined contribution, it is employee. Now, fewer answers, maybe because it was very easy. Other, let me just quickly give one minute explanation. Say, suppose I retire, I give. I in case of defined contribution, I've gotten one CR at retirement, right? The moment I've gotten one CR, I have to live with that particular amount. It can be one CR, two CR, fifty lakhs, whatever it is. But the amount that I'm supposed to get at retirement will be known when I'm retiring. Now, if I live for longer than anticipated. The the increased risk of or the increased burden of that longevity is going to be on me. If I live shorter, in that case also I can accrue that particular benefit. So ultimately, at the point of retirement, when you are an employee, in case of defined contribution scheme, the risk is entirely yours. You have to survive your entire life with the amount that is out there. In case of DB scheme, however, if you end up getting, say, suppose for for every month you get a particular salary, right? Until and unless you have commuted that particular amount. अगर आप कम्यूट नहीं करते हो फॉर एज लॉन्ग एज यू सर्वाइव इवन इफ यू लिव फॉर 120 एंड ट्वेंटी ईयर्स द एम्प्लॉयर इज लीगली बाउंड टू पे यू यू नो द सैलरीज सो इन दिस केस लॉन्जिविटी का रिस्क इन केस ऑफ अ डीबी स्कीम इज विद द एम्प्लॉयर एंड इन केस ऑफ डीसी स्कीम इज विद द एम्प्लॉय इट्स वेरी इजी इन दैट केस यू विल एंड अप फाइंडिंग सारे रिस्क इन केस ऑफ डीसी स्कीम एंड सब गोइंग टू द एम्प्लॉय एंड ऑल द रिस्क इन केस ऑफ डीबी स्कीम इज विद द एम्प्लॉयर सो डीबी स्कीम इज अ एम्प्लॉयर रिस्क हैवी DC scheme may there is more risk of employee on the employee. Tell me one risk uh, in in the jo jo ki will will be inverse in case of DB scheme. What is the risk for the employee? I said most of the risks over here in case of DC scheme, almost all the risks will be employee. In case of DB scheme, almost all the risks will be borne by the employer. Tell me one such risk in case of defined benefit scheme which will be borne by the employee. all right i'll i'll get back to it i thought that you guys knew it so you were not answering i'll i'll get back to it but can you first try to take a crack at that the other question i said let me just explain uh, longevity risk so first thing try to understand most of the risks are borne by the person who is ultimately supposed to i mean the the question was who is bearing the burden of that particular risk right so let's just say it's a defined contribution scheme right defined contribution scheme mein kya hoga all of us are contributing to dc scheme All of us are putting one lakh or you know twelve thousand every month, whatever it is. Whenever we retire at the age of sixty, we'll get a certain amount. Say suppose we retire at the age of sixty and we get two crore rupees each. Just a random example. Now, if you live for forty years after retirement, you need to survive for forty years on that two crore only. If you live for ten years only after retirement, in that case, you only have ten years and you have two crore, which might end up being sufficient. If you end up living sixty years after your retirement, even in that situation, you are supposed to live on that two crores only. So the idea behind a DC scheme is that at the point that you are retiring, you know that you have received or accrued a particular amount. Now, whether you live for a very long period of time or whether you live for only the next ten years or five years, you need to live on that particular amount. So, agar ap if you outlive, let's just say the amount that you received is sufficient only for twenty-five years. Man lo, jo bhi apko amount mila is sufficient only for twenty-five years. so if you live for 25 years very well good good for you 
But if you end up living for 30, 35 or 40 years, the risk is on you because now you don't have money, but you're still living, right? So in that case, living longer is going to be a burden on yourself. Why? Because the amount that you received at retirement was fixed. Now compare that to a DB scheme. DB scheme may kya Say suppose the formula is simple. You retire and you get 1 lakh rupees every month till you survive. You receive 1 lakh rupees for every month till you survive, right? Say suppose you retire at 60. If you, if, if let's just say Mr. X retire at 60 and he lives for only the next 5 years. Good by him because you know the longevity risk in this case is on in, is on the employer. He will get 1 lakh rupees every month till he survives. Same goes for the next 40 years as well. If he survives for the next 40 years, he will still accrue 1 lakh rupees every month. So in this case, the employer ends up bearing the risk of longevity. If the person lives for shorter period, employer gets the reward. If the employee lives for 100 years, the employer has to bear that particular risk. So in this case, wherever uh, you know a person ends up living longer than anticipated or shorter than anticipated. In case of DB scheme, the risk is on employer. In case of DC scheme, the risk is on employee. Longevity risk DB scheme under which risk is borne by employee. Uh, Pratham, was that clear? Benefit received from DC can be passed on to dependents. So basically, in DC, employee will have to suffice with only the amount accrued. Absolutely correct. Yes. So in basically in DC, in case of defined contribution scheme, the employee will have to suffice with only the amount that has been accrued uh, at retirement, and they will get you know a certain amount, and they'll have to live on with that. So in that, so for that reason, because of that reason, longevity ka risk is on you. If you live longer. If you outlive the amount that you have received and you know the entire amount that you received got let's just say spent in the next 10 years, you will have that risk. You don't have money, but you're still living. But that risk is not going to be present. It's likely not to be present in case of a defined benefit scheme because in DB scheme, what happens is you will get a certain amount every month or every year. So if you live for 50 years after retirement also, the risk is basically your employer who will have to pay a higher amount than what he had earlier anticipated. So DC scheme longevity risk is on you. DB scheme the longevity risk is on employer. Same goes for investment risk also, just like we discussed. Now I want from you guys, which is that one particular risk which you think in case of DB scheme which will be borne by uh, an employee? Abhi tak main ye bol raha tha ki jo bhi risk hai, ab simply dekh lo if it is DB scheme, most of the risk will be with the employer. In case of DC scheme, most of the risk will be with the employee. Tell me one such risk. In case of a defined benefit scheme, which will be borne by the employee, and it is within the five that you can see in front of your screen. So, do to ho gaya, you have three remaining. Out of those three risks, which risk do you think will be borne by employee in case of a defined benefit scheme? Uh, yes, Kanika, that is absolutely perfect. Inflation risk if the amount is fixed. Okay, this is one uh, thing I'll tell you. Uh, that is a correct point, but it is not from the five points out there. So inflation risk is correct in case, but there again is an assumption. If the amount you received is fixed, if the amount, or let's just say if the pension amount is fixed, in that case, inflation risk is owned by the employee in DB scheme. But if you think of it the other way around as well, DC scheme me to anyway it is with the employee only. Yes, Aditi, that's the correct answer. Credit risk. Reverse will be credit risk in that DB era credit risk as here. Perfect. So now I'm getting correct answer, but only from a select set of folks. I'm not sure if others have not understood it. If there is any misunderstanding, if I'm moving faster or if I'm moving slower, you have to let me know. And if there is something that you've not understood, just like someone raised a question today, just let me know and I'll I'll be more than happy to you know, take care of that. Please explain how, of course, I'll, I'll be explaining that, uh, but that is correct. So credit resist may be bola, that is absolutely correct. Now let's take up, uh, uh, before we move on to the credit, um, before we move on to credit risk, let's, let's pick up other risk as well. Investment risk ka matlab kya tha? You invest you end up not getting sufficient amount. You have not been able to beat inflation. You have not been able to get sufficient returns. Who is investing in both the cases, in both DB scheme and DC scheme? I don't have investment in my hands. 
डीबी स्कीम में कौन इन्वेस्ट कर रहा है एम्प्लॉयर डीसी स्कीम में कौन इन्वेस्ट कर रहा है ईपीएफओ फॉर नाउ सो इन्वेस्टमेंट इज इन देंड्स ऑफ समन एल्स बट इन केस ऑफ डीसी स्कीम वॉट है If the EPFO fucks up and they don't end up getting good returns, वो तो बोल देंगे कि सर ये रहा वन लाख रुपीज दिस इज वॉट आई हैव फॉर यू यू टेक इट एंड यू लिव विद इट नाउ सो द रिस्क ऑफ हिज पुअर इन्वेस्टमेंट इज ऑन मी इन केस ऑफ अ डीसी स्कीम दैट इज नॉट द केस इन डीबी स्कीम बिकॉज एम्प्लॉयर कांड से माई इन्वेस्टमेंट परफॉर्मेंस वॉज पुअर सो नाउ आई वोट गिव यू वन एक्स ऑफ योर सैलरी आई ओनली गिव यू जीरो पॉइंट फाइव एक्स ही कांट लीगली चेंज द पैरामीटर ऑफ दैट कैलकुलेशन so for that reason in case of a db scheme because he cannot uh, change that particular methodology of calculation the risk is still with the employer whether he performs good or bad is immaterial to me because my amount or my methodology of calculation is fixed so investment risk ek ho gaya next is longevity risk longevity risk mein what did we discuss i have a certain amount in a dc scheme 1 crore 2 crore 10 crore immaterial i get a x amount I need to live with that X with that particular X amount for as long as I survive. If I survive for twenty five years, uh, good. I mean, it, it might be sufficient. But if it is only sufficient for twenty five years, and I outlive and I end up surviving for fifty years after retirement, in that case, I will have a very painful experience because I won't have money, but I'll still be surviving. But that case is not likely to happen in case of a defined benefit scheme because, irrespective of whether I live for ten years, five years, one years, or fifty years. monthly pension is fixed as long as i don't die so for that reason in case of a defined benefit scheme longevity risk is on the employer whether i live for 10 years or whether i live for 100 years he will have to consistently keep paying me that particular amount assuming it's a standard uh, defined benefit scheme now expense risk expense risk ka basically matlab kya hai ki whenever you are investing or whenever you are setting up a particular fund and everything you know there are a lot of expenses behind the scenes in case of Investment there will be multiple risks or let's just say there will be multiple expenses which will be incurred. You will have to hire a fund manager. In case of DB scheme or DC scheme, wherever it is, you will have to hire a fund manager. You will have to uh, you know set up and then entire fund. Uske bhi apne calculations hote hain. You have to publish accounts. Everything you know with that particular scheme, whether it's a DB scheme or a DC scheme, it will end up incurring a lot of expenses. Both the expenses, if you remember, it's very much analogous to what we have. look that in case of investment risk i am not making any of those expenses right but the but you know the burden of that particular expense in case of a dc scheme will be borne by me which means let's just think of if epfo ka example again if epfo ka expenses are a lot right as a result of which the returns are subdued because uh the the fund managers they take a lot of salaries or let's just say there is some uh, embezzlement which covers operational risk as well If EPFO के साथ कुछ भी गड़बड़ होता है, और if their expenses are higher than anticipated, my returns will go down as a result of which the ultimate burden is on me of that expense. Same goes for operations as well. अगर EPFO में an employee takes away hundred crores and runs out of there, in that case, yes, the fraud happened only at EPFO level, but the ultimate burden of that fraud is again going to come on me as an employee. So in case of DC scheme, both expense risk and both operational risk are on me. For similar argument. whether the expenses are higher or lower or whether in case of a db scheme some fund manager runs away with 100 crore doesn't really matter because your methodology of calculation is still fixed aapko retirement pe 1 lakh rupees per month milega that is something which was defined up front so it doesn't matter whether investment gave good return or bad return it doesn't matter whether you live for 100 years or 10 years it doesn't matter whether the fund performed poorly or badly or or, or you know greatly it doesn't matter whether the expenses are 10% or 5% and it doesn't matter if someone runs away with that particular fund uh, assuming that there's still enough money to pay you right all of these risks are ultimately borne by the employer in case of a defined benefit scheme and it will not be borne by the employee in case of a uh, uh, you know db scheme now final uh, one that comes as a part of you know the closure over here is going to be credit risk in case of a defined benefit scheme credit risk is basically on the employee credit risk ka matlab kya hota hai risk of default so credit risk basically is that you know let's just say you give me 1 lakh rupees as a uh, you know you loan me 1 lakh rupees i default on that payment so that is credit risk credit risk is basically risk of default or the risk of not realizing a certain payment which you are otherwise entitled to or subjected to in case of a defined benefit scheme credit risk is basically passed on man lo agar reliance tomorrow fails let's just say reliance goes bankrupt tomorrow as a result of bankruptcy of reliance or let's just say the scheme or sponsor of reliance 
वट विल हैपन यू वर अनटाइटल टू रिसीव वन लैक रुपीज पर मंथ बट देने वाला ही अगर डिफॉल्ट हो जाता है डिफॉल्ट एट द लेवल ऑफ रिलायंस एंड अज्यूमिंग दैट देर स्कीम इज अनफंडेड और यू नो नॉट फंडेड वेल इनफ इन दैट केस यू विल एंड अपरिंग दट पर्टिकुलर बर्डन सो इन केस ऑफ डिफाइंड बेनिफिट स्कीम द क्रेडिट रिस्क डिस्पाइट इट बींग बेनिफिट स्कीम गेट्स पास ऑन टू यू uh because if they default you will of course not end up getting your uh, amount so this is the biggest risk for you as an employee and this is a very uh, uh you know severe risk as well because if at all there is a sponsor benefit uh, sponsor default uh in case of defined benefit scheme you as an employee after your retirement may not end up getting the amount that you were subjected to receive as pension so there cannot be anything which can be worse than this that you know you ended up saving so much amount you ended up being in a position wherein you anticipated to get a certain pension and because your employer has defaulted as a result of that you don't end up getting the particular amount so this is this credit risk is potentially the biggest risk for employee in case of a defined benefits scheme that covers up most of the risks any questions let me know we'll just quickly cover up hybrid risk as well there's something which is said so among operational credit and investment risk operational risk is most pertinent to employees in defined benefit pension scheme as it encompasses risk related to administration and management of the plan that can directly affect the accuracy and timeliness of pension payment how credit risk as the risk that employer or plan sponsor will default on the financial obligation while significant credit risk is greatly a concern for the employer's ability to fund i am look i mean that is i mean there are two ways about it one risk is that so there are two credit risks within this one is that me as a member me manlo where i am saying me i am basically the sponsor of defined benefit scheme i make certain investments and usme there is let's say a default of course the risk in that particular case is of is is mine right but me as an employee when i'm thinking through the lens of an employee there is a credit risk or if you slash the word credit and if you and if you replace it with the word default you will end up realizing that you as a member of a defined benefit scheme assuming that it is not funded well enough you can still end up getting a lot of default risk from a defined benefit scheme and that is something which has actually happened in a lot of cases recently and most of the questions you will realize when you look at a lot of questions going forwards a lot of questions because they are very practical in nature they will ask you that you know mr x or let's just say xyz company is a is it's it's in you know it's it's in textile manufacturing blah 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 they'll give you some unnecessary background and then they will say that they had a defined benefit scheme now they want to close that particular scheme and move on to defined contribution scheme and if you look at it there are multiple global organizations as well as global governments as well which are moving on from defined benefit scheme to defined contribution scheme the reason being very simple two fold here first is that defined benefit scheme is a significant burden on the employer as you can see over here investment risk longevity risk expense risk operational risk all of those risks are basically uh, for the are, are you know basically taken care of by the employer of course some bit of operational risk like you mentioned is passed on to the employee as well because if you are not able to let's just say make timely payments but i was not talking about timely payments over there i was thinking it from you know operational parameters within the sponsor ki operationally they are not efficient enough or operationally let's just say they have they have a lackluster performance or let's just say there is some sort of fraud or embezzlement at the level of the sponsor so if something like that happens all of those risks are still not passed on to the employee it still is borne by the employer only uh, and i'm not let's just say bifurcating between trust the sponsor employee and employer right now let's just keep it simple between employee and the employer for the time being so employer will still bear all those risks irrespective because legally he is entitled or legally the employee is entitled to receive all the payments assuming that you know there is no default but if the employer defaults ki employer ke paas sufficient paisa nahi hai the scheme is unfunded he has not have or he has not you know invested sufficient amount to provide for it and in a lot of cases this happen there are multiple pay as you go uh, schemes as well which we'll look at later on it will come as a part of your syllabus later on in a lot of these cases you will end up realizing that db schemes become a very big burden to the employer they end up defaulting on payments to the employees because it is unsustainable for that matter and for those reasons a lot of defined benefit schemes are today getting con getting converted into defined contribution scheme and that is that kind of questions is what you will get, end up getting in a lot of cases there is only one question which i am aware of jisme ek aisa stem hai i think it was may 2023 iii just noted down may 20 this one second 
So May 2023, IAI, because IAI does, you know what it does. They have this question in May 2023, IAI paper B. They have been talking about a particular scheme wherein defined contribution scheme tha, it gets closed and it gets converted into a defined benefit scheme. That is the only question wherein it's kind of flipped. Most of the other question or every other question which I have had a look at, which you will see in the revision notes, they will say that there is a defined benefit scheme. It is now closed and they are moving on to defined contribution scheme. The only question wherein it's flipped is May 23 II. So we'll uh, just note it down and ensure that you're looking at that question right after the class today as well. Employees need to be aware of the risk and take proactive steps to diversify their retirement savings and stay informed about the employer's financial health to mitigate the potential impact. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Is this concept correct? Even otherwise, you need to diversify. I mean, diversification as a benefit, of course, has a, I mean, diversification as a, uh, uh, you know, stem it itself has a lot of benefits. So we look at that. It encompasses the risk of employer failing to meet its financial obligations, which can lead to reduced benefit, delayed payment, or even uh, plan termination. Yes, all of these things are possible in case of a defined benefit scheme. In multiple cases, recently, job questions, they okay, defined benefit scheme gets stopped. It can be stopped for future accrual as well. And what those future accruals are and everything, we'll look at that in a little more depth as we kind of move forwards. But you need to be careful about the fact that DB scheme is a very big burden on the employer. If you look at it practically, that is the reason why Practically, if you look a lot of DB schemes get closed, they get converted into DC schemes so that all of these risks can basically be passed on to the uh, employee. So, these are risks they are all employees' risk in case of a defined contribution scheme. Investment performs poorly, you bear the burden. You live longer, you bear the burden. Uh, there is a lot of expenses. Transfer, mein manlo, there is, let's just take a random example. Manlo, UPI se transfer or let's just say whatever it is, and NEFT or whatever it is happening, the transfer ends up taking 10, 20 percent of the amount. In that case, also you will end up getting the risk. Operationally, let's just say there are default or whatever it is, you bear the risk, and credit risk, of course, is your in case of a defined contribution scheme. So all the risks are basically yours when you're a member of a defined contribution scheme. Now, hybrid scheme is basically simple in that sense. It will end up having a mix of both. Some part of a defined benefit. Uh, some part of it will be defined benefit and some part of it will be defined contribution, which can be like you contribute 6% every month and whatever is accumulated, you will get that particular amount plus over and above that 10% of your monthly salary will also be paid to you after your retirement. So something like that, which is a mix and match of both is some part of defined benefit is also taken into consideration and some part of defined contribution is also taken into consideration. That kind of a scheme becomes uh, a hybrid or a defined ambition scheme. Pahle is for defined ambition scheme. Bolte the. Right now, I mean, there aren't a lot of questions from this. So uh, really can't say that, you know, they have changed this word, but they have changed the word to hybrid scheme recently. And uh, hybrid schemes, I haven't really looked at a lot of questions that have come practically from both IA and from IFO. But DB scheme and DC scheme, pe both questions aate hai, specifically on the risks associated with both. Who bears the risk? How can you transfer the risks? And all of these things become very important when you're looking at the, uh, you know, uh, when you're looking at benefits. So be very careful that you understand all of these things very carefully. And don't worry just yet. Abhi, we have just looked at it. We'll look at questions and then define benefit scheme. What is trust? What is sponsor? Uh, you know, how, what is basically future accrual? I, I use the word future accrual a lot today, but I don't anticipate you to understand what is future accrual. What happens if future accruals get stopped? All of these things will be discussed later on. So uske liye you don't really have to worry. You just need to get basic understanding of what DB scheme is, what DC scheme is, who bears which risk and why. If all of these things are clear later on as we kind of move ahead, uh, because it's very uh, significant chunk of your uh, you know syllabus, we'll look at a lot of questions which will clear other doubts that you guys might have. Um, that was your, uh, just one second. Uh, so that was your pension basically Abhi tak humne benefits only from the lens of this of you know pension is what we have covered so far other than that you will end up finding uh there are multiple other organizations or multiple other structures which can end up providing you benefit one can be state the other one can be employer the third one is individual you yourself fourth one is financial or, or uh, uh, intermediaries or organizations and the fifth one is other organizations now, in what way can state provide you benefits or in what way can employer provide you benefits? That is, again, something which is kind of partially important, I would say. IAI has asked a few questions directly from it. 
IFOA usually won't ask you direct questions from over here because you know it's it's already available, so you can just you know uh, jot it down and write it down. But understanding all of these points will be clear, will be important. So state may provide benefits which can be retirement, it can be medical care, it can be unemployment related benefits, which is widespread in a in in, in a in, in a country like US. It can be other welfare benefits also, which is like incapacity benefits. If you are incapacitated for whatever reason, in that case, you'll end up getting a particular amount. And you know, there can be free hospitals. There are multiple ways in which basically state can provide you benefits. So wherever state is incurring any expenditure for the welfare of its uh, you know citizens, all of those things pertain as a part of your benefits. It's not just retirement pension over and above that critical illness, medical care, hospitals, education, uh, unemployment related benefits or any other welfare schemes that they run in particular, all of these things will come, will fall as a part of your state benefits itself. So these are the different ways in which they can or different schemes that they can sponsor in order to provide benefits. Now you need to be careful about what are the different ways or different rules that they pay in order to disseminate this, right? So. If you look at it, it is in decreasing order of you know money being spent. So first one is direct provision, which basically means he, they are directly, let's just say, crediting that particular amount, right? He, direct provision in case of retirement is basically whoever retires from military service will get a X amount of pension. So it's like direct provision, entirely administered by state, entirely paid by state. There is no third party intervention. There is no one else coming in. State employee. The, basically the government employees uh, sorry the government acts as the employer for army officials once they retire they get that amount it's a very simple structure so direct provision is basically they provide benefits to some or all of the other population this was one such example it can also be let's just say old age hospitals or old k or, or you know critical care institutes whatever it is so they directly provide for that specific amount for a specific set of population as simple as that second one can be where they act as sponsor for the provision of such benefits. In this case, it can be perhaps by providing appropriate financial instruments. So the government can act as a sponsor and they can provide certain financial instruments as a result of which you can end up getting certain benefits. So for example, there can be certain bonds in which you can invest, which will provide you certain benefits, something of that sort, right? So they can directly provide you a certain amount or they can provide you a space just like an EPFO for that, for that matter. EPFO is a sponsor of provision for such benefit. Why? EPFO is administered by the state. The entire premise of EPFO is that your contributions get you know accumulated over there. And when you retire, you get that particular amount. So state is not directly, I mean, they're incurring some expense for that matter. It's not free of cost, of course. There is some expenses being incurred by the state as well. But the basic idea behind this is that government does not directly fund for it. We as individuals are funding. They have just set up a particular institute as a result of which we're and we, we end up getting, you know, certain benefits. So direct provision may direct credit with your bank account. Mein. Sponsors may they're basically setting up institutes and facilities and premises which will help you guys get certain benefits in the future. Third one can be provide financial benefits through tax system. And that is what ends up happening to all of us, right? When we invest in life insurance products, we end up getting 1,50,000 ka rebate under ATC, assuming you're in the old, old, old regime. Similar to that, whenever you're paying for health insurance as well, you get tax deductions. So state can also provide benefits by way of reducing the burden of tax when you end up taking a particular uh, activity. You invest in LIC or uh, you invest in any particular you know, life insurance scheme, you get benefits. You invest in any uh, health insurance scheme, you get benefits. So that is another way in which they can incentivize you to take a particular course of action for yourself but the burden or let's just say some amount of that burden is borne by the state. How? Because they are not or let's just say they're reducing the amount of tax burden which you would otherwise have to pay. So they are taking lesser taxes from you and facilitating this particular uh, arrangement. Next one can be educate or require education about the importance of providing for future. So they can run, run various awareness schemes or something of that sort. And, uh, you know, with that, they can educate a lot of folks and, you know, get going with it. Fifth one is regulate or encourage or compel benefit provision by or on behalf of some of the population. Now, this is very similar to the second stem over here. You can regulate or encourage or in certain cases, you can compel benefits as well. So if you know employee EPFO is a mandatory provision, it's not a voluntary provision. Any employer who has more than 50 or I think 25 employees, there's a certain 
uh, threshold. Over and above that, you are mandatorily required to register for EPFO. So certain situations, they can provide you, you know, certain provisions which are voluntary. They can give you certain financial incentives which are voluntary. But at a certain point of time, they can also, uh, you know, compel certain benefits uh, for you, which is given in part number five over here. So if at all you are an employer, you have 25 plus employees, you need to compulsorily register for EPFO and you need to ensure that each and every employee contributes to that. Same goes for employee state insurance as well. 12% of the pay is mandatory, above that is uh -huh, voluntary. I mean, yeah, similar to that. So there can be certain ways in which, you know, they can identify that, you know, yaha tak voluntary hai or, you know, or maybe yaha tak mandatory hai. Over and above this, it can be voluntary. Same goes for a lot of smaller, let's just say, people who are earning up to 5,000 or 10,000. Employee state insurance is mandatory in that case because those are usually on the job, you know, front ended workers who are, let's just say, factory laborers or something like that. And they may end up, you know, uh, getting, let's just say, some sort of illness, sickness, or some sort of accidents because they are prone to that. As a result of that, employees who are earning only X amount are mandatorily required to get uh, employee state insurance, which is actually paid by the, or let's just say, facilitated by the employer. So they can compel certain benefits as well. And they can regulate bodies that provide benefits. For example, you know, there are multiple bodies in, in India which provide certain benefits. All of them are basically regulated by the, uh, uh, these are basically regulated by the government. So these are multiple ways in, in you know, let's just say descending order of cost incurred, if you may say at least the first few. Pehle mein direct amount gets credited out of, credited into the wallet uh, by the uh, state. Second one, they're sponsoring, providing institutes for you to facilitate that particular payment or providing intermediaries for you so that you can get certain benefits. Third one, they can provide you tax intensive, uh, tax incentive, tax breaks in order to, you know, increase the penetration of certain products. Fourth one is educate, run awareness programs. Fifth one is basically if you're not first four, say if you're still not, uh, you know, well enough and, you know, a lot of people in India, at least they still don't care about first four. So they compel benefits in a lot of cases. And sixth one, of course, they regulate a lot of bodies so that, I mean, the moment you're giving any particular, any particular money, let's just say that comes. NPS can come under 0.6 as well. It can also come under 0.2 because NPS is not, it will definitely not come under 0.5. Now that you've taken a good example, NPS will be point number two because they have, you know, they're sponsoring the provision of such benefits. They act as sponsor and it also comes under point number six because it's a regulated entity. So whenever you're investing in NPS, you're virtually certain of any, you know, ki default ho sakta hai. there is zero probability of default whatever amount 50,000 or whatever it is that you're contributing once you retire at the age of 60 you're certain to get that particular amount so it's a it can be somewhere between 0.4 as well they educate you in one way or the other and it can be some part of it can be 0.2 as well and some part of it can be uh, 0.6 not really necessary to know uh, maybe if you're from IA, it might be because they can ask you certain questions so nps basically is national pension scheme uh, you can Google it. It's, it's basically, you know, over and above your ATC ka contribution, you can invest up to a certain amount and you can end up getting tax breaks for that particular investment that you have made. If I'm not wrong, I think it is up to 50,000. There, there is a provision to increase it beyond 50,000 and get tax benefit as well, but you will get that money only after you retire at the age of 60, if I'm not wrong. So you need to contribute that particular amount. You retire at the age of 60, you get that, you, you get back that particular amount with, of course, accruals. And uh, till the time you are making those uh, payments, you will not have to pay any tax on that. So you get tax in tax incentive on whatever contributions you're making and your final receipt at the age of 60 is also free of taxation. Uh, so for that reason, you can say that it's a part of two, four and six uh, for that matter. So a good example uh, for us to, and it's definitely not one because they're not provisioning. Uh, there's no, I mean, it is a part of three as well. They're providing financial incentive. They're educating, they're regulating. Uh, but it is not compulsory as well. So, I mean, you can look at particular example and fit, fit, I mean, fill in the blanks as to, you know, which are the provisions, uh, that are basically provided by state as a result of that particular scheme. Same goes for employer as well. Employer, of course, won't do all the six. There are three out of the six, which he does. They educate, they finance, uh, uh the benefit of employees in an orderly manner. And, you know, in certain cases, when employers themselves are running a defined benefit scheme, of course, it's through a, through a sponsor, but in a way they're financing for your benefits, right? Because one way or the other, they're supposed to contribute ideally. In an ideal world, they would be contributing enough so that 
the scheme in itself is funded well enough so that when you retire there is no burden on the employer to make any particular payment so idea is that the employer he educates you he tries to guide you he may also say that you know there might be an email that comes to you that invest in nps and save taxes something of that sort so the employer's role is to educate you to guide you to you know in, i mean increase the penetration of certain instruments at your end they also finance certain benefits and they also end up providing a particular facility or in certain cases a scheme for the provision of benefits in the example of which is the employer sponsored pension scheme or employer sponsored let's just say defined uh, benefit pension scheme for the uh, time being so they can act as sponsor they directly incur certain uh, costs which is like provisioning and they can educate as well what they cannot do is they cannot provide regulatory bodies they cannot provide you any financial incentive like tax breaks and uh, they cannot compel benefits as well in in a lot of cases so i mean legally because they're not allowed to so out of these six maybe one two and four is what uh, an employer uh, can do for yours it can do for you uh, similar to what you know uh, basically the state or the government does relation to financing of benefits relation to scheme provision so we'll look at this in a bit role of individuals and financial institutions yes so at the end you will end up finding there are certain things which are still pending we'll cover those up as well uh, but you need to be very careful about you know i mean at the end of the day you should ideally be in a position wherein you look at this and you're able to you know crack the code there are benefits and overview main providers are the state what what does the state do employers what do they do now let's just look at the last three which is basically individuals financial institutions and uh, your uh, other corporates so you as an individual you can you know provide for yourself you can basically you know keep saving a certain amount in order to ensure that at the end of the day when you are retiring you have sufficient amount at yourself at your end as well and you are not totally dependent on the state or on the employer so in order to diversify the risk like someone had just mentioned a while back you can contribute for yourself maybe start saving in some schemes maybe start saving by way of mutual funds or maybe diversify your entire bunch of portfolio so that at the end of the day at the age of 60 when you're retiring you yourself are a provider of benefits towards uh, yourself next one is basically financial institutions which includes your uh, uh, financial intermediaries it can be banks it can be uh, you know uh, what do you call it insurers what they end up doing is two things number one is they educate you they educate as to you know what are the different schemes that are available for you not necessarily true that they're always educating you for your benefit they're potentially educating you so that you know they can sell uh, certain schemes but at the same time they also sell you a lot of schemes for instance let's just say an annuity scheme sold by an insurance company now they are provider of benefit of course they will ask you for a lump sum to begin with but let's just say you have attained the age of 40 you want to retire and let's just say you have a lump sum of 10 crores available what you can do you can basically submit that 10 crores to an insurance company and they can provide you with an annuity payment for the next 10 20 30 40 years however long you live so in this situation it's not government it's not employer also it's basically in financial uh, a financial intermediary who is providing for your uh, annuity payments so in this situation financial institutions may end up uh, you know basically as a provider of certain financial incentives to you and the finance and the final one is basically uh, other corporation there can be certain ccrcs which is continuous care retirement communities uh, there can be trade unions which end up providing you with certain benefits there can be employer associations there can also be certain ngos which does not which do not fall uh, you know in the bracket of 1 2 3 and 4 which can end up sponsoring or providing you with certain benefits uh, within this so these are you know the major provider of benefits and what their incentives or you know or different ways in which they can provide you with certain benefits right so major takeaway from this chapter has to be two first is being able to identify the differences between db and dc scheme and who bears which risk in case of a db scheme and a dc scheme second one is to ensure that the word i mean the moment you look at that particular word you know benefits don't get taken away or don't think of it just as uh let's just say your uh, pension or something of that sort it need not necessarily be pension because as you've seen right now you yourself or certain other uh institutions can also provide you with multiple benefits so those are two three key takeaways from over here we'll continue with this particular chapter and we'll look at a few more things 
do ensure that you are looking at the pdf which has been uploaded the name of the pdf i think is chapter 5 benefits overview there are i think just four questions do ensure you are looking at that try to take a crack at that and once we are done with that we'll look at this we'll look at a few more questions tomorrow and if required we'll probably go on to chapter 30 to 33 wherein you know uh benefits scheme is discussed in more detail so that we can close the loop of benefits and then move on to the next chapter so that's kind of it from my end for today guys uh if there is any question of course i'm here for the next 5 minutes more than happy to uh, facilitate any q and a otherwise i'll see you guys tomorrow same time 10:30 and tomorrow might be a slightly longer or lengthier class as compared to what we took today and uh, yeah be prepared for that and do ensure you looking at those questions that's it guys and yeah there was one question before i uh, if if there is any question other than the question which was asked initially do let me know because i would want to discuss that all right guys i'll take that as no question so that's it from my end for today